The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leslie McGee with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to today's presentation, Implementation Research and Practice, Improving Outcomes for People and Communities. I will introduce our speakers shortly. I would like to share a little bit of information before we get started. The Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC. We work with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. We're here to help APS programs in any way we can. Just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. A copy of today's slides are posted under the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel and can be downloaded from there. You may use computer audio or your phones to access audio for this webinar. We ask that you please mute your phones, headsets, or computer mics unless you are speaking so that we can eliminate any background noise. If you experience audio problems during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar and re-enter. This is intended to be an interactive discussion and there will be opportunities for questions and comments during the presentation. However, if you prefer to submit your questions or comments in writing, you may type them in the chat box at any time during the presentation, even if we have moved on to another slide. This presentation is being recorded and will be hosted to the web at a later date. We will notify all attendees via email when it is posted online. Everyone attending today will receive an email approximately 24 hours from now with a link to download your certificate of attendance. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Allison Metz. Allison is a developmental psychologist and certified coach with expertise in child development and family systems and a commitment to improving outcomes and advancing equity for children and families. Allison currently serves as the director of the National Implementation Research Network, NERN, senior research scientist and implementation division lead at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute, research professor at the School of Social Work, an adjunct professor, professor at the School of Global Public Health at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Allison is also a co-chair of the UNC Institute on Implementation Science, where she convenes workshops on implementation practice and equitable implementation. Allison supports implementation in a range of human service settings, with a particular focus on child welfare and early childhood contexts. She conducts practice-informed research on the roles of trust, relationship, and power in implementation and serves as a leadership coach and facilitator to support change efforts in service systems and communities. Allison has authored peer-reviewed articles and a practice guide on the competencies needed to support effective implementation with a particular focus on the importance of relational skills and values. Before Allison begins her presentation, I would like to add that although her work has been primarily focused within the context of child welfare and related programs, we have asked her to provide this presentation because the practice and principles of implementation science are especially relevant to the projects and initiatives being completed under the state grants to enhance APS. I would also like to advise all attendees that due to a technical issue with the system, we will have to end today's presentation promptly at 2.55. I'm sure it is disappointing to some of you that we have to end a few minutes early. Please accept our apologies for any inconvenience. Now I would like to turn it over to Allison. Sure, thank you so much, Leslie. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you just fine. Oh, thank you, that's great. And, and thanks so much for, for noting that even though I do most of my work in, in children's services, that um, the, I'll be focusing today on implementation science, which is relevant to all service systems. So I look forward to talking about that. Um, and thanks so much for that, that warm welcome and introduction. Um, if we can move to the next slide. 
I would love to just hear from the folks uh, that have joined us today. Um, if you'd like to, you can just check in in the chat. That would be really fun for me to see. Um, so your name, uh, the role uh, that you play, so just your professional role. Love to hear how you're doing today. And for fun, you can type into the chat if you prefer beach or mountain, salty or sweet, early bird or night owl, dogs or cats. So I can model for you guys and you could pop this into the chat. So as Leslie said, I'm Allison Metz. I direct the National Implementation Research Network. I'm doing just fine today. It's actually a beautiful spring day where I am. And in terms of my preferences, they are a little sometimes hard for me to choose. So I like to say I like mountains with a water feature because I have a little trouble choosing between those. I'm definitely a sweet tooth, definitely an early bird and prefer oh both dogs and cats although i have a very needy cat so i like to um to do that <laughs> so at any time if you want to pop those in the chat that's always fun for me to see if we have any patterns we typically have a lot of early birds so i'm always curious if we have any night owls but you can move forward leslie and we'll just see as things pop up in the chat so the goals for today are to um, have all participants, um, everyone on today, to learn about implementation science and key best practices uh, for using implementation science in service systems. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the stages of implementation and how that can guide implementation of adult protective services um, and programs. So hopefully you'll you'll that will feel resonant for you the idea of stage based work when we're implementing um, either new or adapted programs and services or trying to scale something. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we think of as as the skills and competencies needed to really support implementation efforts. So we think about this from a practice perspective for those of us that have uh, professional. Uh, jobs that require us to support change in some way. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the skills that are needed to do that and the values that can really help guide guide us in those efforts. And just a little spoiler alert, that's my absolutely favorite topic, uh, but it is at the end and I'm hoping I'm hoping that we can get to it. So we can move to the next slide. Oh, and thank you guys for putting stuff in the chat. <laughs> So we do have, um, those are really fun for me to see. I love it. And typically dogs do win out. So I like the fact that we have some of both and, you know, we'll see if we get any cat lovers. So if we think about why, um, what is implementation science and why does it matter? So I'm going to start off with giving some really kind of basic definitions and talk, talk about um, why it matters so much uh, to get to good outcomes. So we can move to the next slide. So I really think of, of implementation science as, as including both uh, implementation research and implementation practice. Um, and I think it's those two things that really fully make up the science of implementation. So if we think about implementation research, this is how we understand the approaches that we can use to help translate research into real world settings. So for example, if you have an intervention or a service program that is found to be effective in a research study, how do you take that into the real world? How do you scale it? So implementation research would study those approaches and strategies. And then implementation practice seeks to apply, adapt, contextualize those specific strategies across different contexts and service settings. So let me give you just an example um, to hopefully make this clear for folks. So one of the things that, that implementation research has taught us over the years is that implementation cannot rely on training alone, that training, no matter how well done, does not lead to implementation. While it's an important ingredient to implementation, we've historically, over the last 20 years or so, really relied on training um, and kind of been like, okay, everybody's trained, so we're good to go. So implementation research found out that that's not enough, and they talk about other strategies. So I'll, one of those would be training plus coaching. 
the idea that practitioners need coaching following training in order to generalize the skills that they need um, and, and to be able to use them um, in different settings. So, okay, so implementation research then has taught us that an approach or strategy that's really important is coaching. So from an implementation practice perspective, we have to figure out how to integrate coaching into our implementation efforts. And that might look different project to project or setting to setting. So sometimes you might have external coaches, sometimes you might be relying on supervisors to also play a coaching role. Sometimes you might be doing peer coaching, um, some sort of kind of collaborative um, support or peer support that, that we're using. So the idea is, is that implementation research gives us these, these important findings over what it takes to implement well, and then we have to try try that out differently across the different projects we have. And then typically what happens is new questions emerge. So, you know, I just actually had a question recently. We were trying to use coaching and we had a lot of programs we were working with and we had to test out whether or not um, having group coaching would be as effective as one-on-one -on -one coaching. Luckily, the data is showing us that group coaching seems to be standing up and we don't necessarily need one-on-one -on -one coaching for that project. So the, that's how those two things work together to, to build the science. Okay, we can move to the next slide. So the overall goal of implementation is to integrate research and practice in ways that improve the outcomes of those being served. So that's really the goal is, is to make sure that research and practice meet and they do so in the best possible ways so that we can have um, both improved and equitable outcomes for the populations that we work with. We can move to the next slide. So we have a definition of equitable implementation and um, I love to talk about this um, a lot more. Um, and I know we're gonna be kind of short on time today, but this comes from some work we've been doing in partnership with the Annie e. Casey Foundation for the last four or five years. Um, we, we describe equitable implementation as occurring when strong equity components, including explicit attention to culture, history, values, and both the assets and needs of a community are integrated into the principles of implementation and that we facilitate quality implementation for specific communities and groups of communities. So this is um, some work that we've, we've been doing, as I noted, with the NEK Foundation. We have several blogs on this topic. We um, actually have a special um, issue of the Stanford Social Innovation Review that will be coming out next month that looks at case examples of how implementation science can be used explicitly to advance equity. Uh, so it's, it's a really uh, important topic and I'm happy to take some questions about that in the chat if that comes up. Okay, we can move forward. So just some basic, I just have a, a couple of slides on, you know, why does implementation matter so much? And it's an interesting, um, you know, question. I think those of us that, that, that actually work in practice settings, you know, know that implementation matters. It, it feels almost like a little bit of a dust statement, right? Like that it seems so important. But for a really long time, there, there, there wasn't that much focus on implementation. As I noted earlier, there was heavy reliance on things like training. Um, and other dissemination methods that really didn't actively build infrastructure or support for folks to both implement and sustain interventions for long enough periods of time to get to um, those positive outcomes. So um, about a little over a decade ago, um, there was an article that came out um, literally titled Implementation Matters. And it actually, I, I think is one of these kind of seminal articles because it was a meta-analysis that looked across 500 studies, and it was um, really specifically in promotion and prevention programs, um, and, and looked at those 500 studies to, to, to try and determine the extent to which implementation did matter. And what it showed was really strong empirical support for the conclusion that the level of implementation quality directly affects the implementation outcome. And so that, that article, again, was, was pretty seminal uh, about 13 years ago, and I think really set the stage for implementation science to kind of take on some more urgency over the last 10 years as, as we thought about, well, what does it mean to actually scale evidence-based programs, and, and how is it we do that? Because simply disseminating them uh, doesn't seem to be enough. We can move to the next slide. 
There's another article I just wanted to mention because it, it, it was influential in my life and, and it was even older than, than the one I just showed called the break even point. And it actually came out of healthcare. But what it showed was that um, achieving fidelity may be more complex than developing a new innovation or technology or pharmaceutical. And so what I mean by that is, you know, um, in healthcare, we might produce a certain pharmaceutical a drug that we think you know will will be really helpful, and when it and and when it doesn't have its intended benefit, what we often would do is go back and create more drugs and do different randomized control trials. When in fact, most likely, what was happening is is the the initial drugs that had showed a lot of benefit in clinical trials weren't being um, uh, deployed in a way that that was helpful. So it might be that there needed to be more training for physicians and nurses. There might need to be more access to this. There might need to be more, more discussion with patients about what, what could work for them. And so all the implementation supports that would be needed um, were not put in place. And so we kind of go back to the drawing board. And while that example is from healthcare, I think you know that, that still holds true for a lot of the work we do in social services, that, that um, there are interventions that we know are helpful for the populations we work with, but rather than really putting the resources and the funding and the time into ensuring that they're implemented well, we're often putting more dollars into intervention research and developing more interventions. Now, I think intervention research is still really important. It's important for the fields that I work in. I'm sure it's important for the field that you work in, but we want to be able to, to, to put some more equal dollars um, into implementation because there are things um, that could be effective if we could get them out there um, consistently and, and sustainably. We can move to the next slide. So I noted this idea of training alone uh, does not lead uh, to implementation. So what this slide shows is historically, you know, um, prior to implementation science really taking hold, there were a lot of dissemination strategies that were used um, with the hope of, of getting to better outcomes. So this might be sharing information, you know, simply uh, dissemination. And while that might increase knowledge and awareness, it doesn't actually lead to behavior change typically. Uh, I noted that training uh, typically does not also lead to behavior change. People need more support than simply being in a, a training. Policy changes, funding incentives, these are the kinds of things that that might um, incentivize some level of change, but they don't actually ensure competency or capacity. So we can um, put out um, practice guidelines, we can incentivize um, funding for certain programs and practices, um, but if we don't also put the resources into supporting folks to implement them well, um, we, we typically don't yield the benefits that, that we'd want to yield. So while these strategies on this slide are helpful, um, and in many cases necessary, when we use just one or two of them, they're really not sufficient. So we can move to the next slide. So the way that we think about implementation is using this, it's basically you know, a, a formula for simplicity's sake. I, I often think of it as more of a heuristic device that allows me to do good reflection and diagnostic work so that I can understand you know, what the implementation challenges might be. So we know that we need an effective practice and so that means, you know, kind of the obvious thing that there would be some level of, of evidence, in particular research evidence, that this would be a good thing to, to try. Uh, but we also, when we think of something as effective, we also want to make sure that it's well operationalized so that we clearly can describe what it is. And again, that might seem pretty obvious, but in a lot of the fields that I work in, um, a lot of the practices that we use are not that well defined, um, and therefore they're not that transferable uh, to different service settings. Um, and then the other thing we look for is strong contextual fit. And I'm going to talk about that more in just a moment. First, and then once we have an effective practice, we know we need to implement it effectively. So there's a couple things that fall in there. One, we need to sequence the work. So that's the idea of stage-based implementation. I'm gonna talk more about that. And that we need to create an infrastructure that's really visible and is in service to implementing whatever it is we've chosen to implement well. And so that would include how we build um, practitioners' competency 
but also how we put the organizational and system supports in place. And again, I'll talk about that a bit more as we move through the webinar. And then we also need an enabling context, we need an environment that is hospitable to this new way of work. So that's where you can start to think about funding and policy and communication and stakeholder engagement and feedback loops and all those really big important things that go beyond the actual service setting. Um, and that, that really create an environment that either can make or break something for being sustained. So you might think of an enabling context, you know, from a, from a policy and funding perspective, one of the things we're always concerned about is fiscal sustainability. So we might start off a program um, in a certain system or community with, with philanthropic funding, but know that the only way that we're going to sustain it is if we create an enabling context for it, and that might include ensuring it's, you know, Medicaid reimbursable. So we start kind of thinking about, you know, how we're going to, to do that really early on in a project. So those three things are what really lead to those improved population outcomes. And the reason we have multiplication signs there instead of addition signs is because anything times zero is zero. So you can have the most effective practice, um, but if you don't implement it well, or there's not a context that will sustain it, we won't get to those outcomes. Or we can have a, a really strong enabling context. So we could have those kind of policy and funding incentives in place, you know, that might come from federal or state government, but if we're not effectively implementing the programs um, that those policies are, are, are meant to incentivize us to implement, we still won't get uh, to those outcomes. You can move to the next slide. I love it, by the way, I saw in the chat that you guys um, <laughs> to go team night owls. That was really great. So there are, uh, there are a couple of night owls. I love working with night owls because I'm an early bird and it's really helpful when um, I might attend to something really early in the morning and then you know you have a colleague that is going to be happy to look at, do a late review of something. So that's always great. Um, if you feel comfortable putting into the chat, I just thought it'd be fun to hear from you before we get into any more details. What's one thing that you think is most important for the successful implementation of programs and services? So if you were to think of that one thing that you kind of think makes or breaks successful implementation, what would that be? And I'd love to hear from you. And I will I will continue to, to monitor the chat um, as we go through. So I know we're a bit short on time, Leslie, so I'm just going to move to the next slide. And as people put that one thing uh, into the chat box, I'll, I'll take a look for it. So the way uh, that I'll it... Yeah. I'm sorry, we do, we're getting a couple of comments in the questions box instead of the chat, but the response we received just now is buy-in from staff. Okay, great. Yes, I'm not seeing um, the question, so, so that's great. Buy-in from staff. Thank you so much. I think that that is critical. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Okay, we'll talk about that buy-in from staff as we talk about stage-based implementation. So I agree. I think it is really critical. I also think those conversations about buy-in really need to have us also focus on what people might feel like they're losing or what they feel is at risk when we start new implementation efforts, that, that buy-in is, is associated with people's you know, sense of comfort um, and, and safety and trying something new, psychological safety. So happy to, to talk more about that. We can move to the next slide. So if we think about that, that formula, we're gonna focus on that middle part, effective implementation, which seems about right, um, given the title of the webinar. And so we're gonna talk about how we really build something sustainable to support implementation and, and really achieve uh, quality implementation and results. So we can move forward. So the frame we're going to use, as I noted, is a stage-based frame. So we think of implementation as happening in four stages. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight the types of activities we conduct in each stage. And then I'm also going to talk about the outcomes we want to see at each stage so that we can be really outcomes focused. Because sometimes it's hard to know when we're doing really complex work whether or not we're making progress. Um, so I want to 
talk up and hopefully bring some clarity to how we know we're making implementation progress and kind of what should also feel really normal during implementation. So a couple of things to keep in mind, and it's why this graphic is circular and not from left to right, is implementation is not inherently linear, you know? So it is developmental. So there are activities you conduct in exploration, for example, that set you up to be more successful in the next stage, right? So if you kind of don't really do good exploration work, your installation phase, which I'll describe in a moment, can be really challenged. So there is this developmental aspect to the work, but the reason it's not inherently linear is there's a couple reasons, actually. The first is that you are often in more than one stage of implementation at the same time. So very common that you would be in exploration and installation at the same time. And also really common that you might be in three stages, exploration, installation, and initial implementation. And the reason that is, is because we have these other forces at play, whether that, you know, funding mandate, you know, in terms of the speed of work or, or, or really even just the needs of the population we're working with, those needs could be so urgent that the idea of spending a lengthy time on exploration just doesn't seem realistic. So often what we have are folks that are still doing some exploring, still trying to install, you know, that basically means get everyone trained and coached and get their data systems up and running and really install that infrastructure at the same time that they're starting service delivery. That is like incredibly common. And the other thing that's really common is that you may actually make it to initial implementation, like launching a new service but you may not make it then to full implementation because something happens. We have an election, we have, you know, um, some leadership transition, we have funding, you know, cuts, something happens and we have a lot of staff turnover and we end up kind of moving backwards a little bit. And then we have to move back a little bit in order to move forward. These are very common, very, very common aspects of implementation. But the reason we still like to think about the stages is because it's really important to know what stage or stages uh, organization or a, a service system is in so that we can provide stage match support. So I'm 100% fine if someone's in initial implementation and they haven't yet finished all their exploration and installation activity. Then I might just say, okay, you're in three stages and here's how much you've completed from each stage. So let's not ignore the exploration activities just because you've had to move quickly. Let's try and do some of that work concurrently. So we can move to the next stage. I mean, the next slide. So something that um, is really important about this and why we don't want to ignore exploration work, even if we're rushed in implementation, is there's some really nice empirical evidence that if we spend time on those first two stages, we are more likely to actually successfully make it through initial implementation and to eventually achieve those outcomes. So these are really important messages for partners that we work with and funders that actually we are less likely to make it successfully through initial implementation if we haven't done the important work of exploration. So again, it's okay to be a bit rushed as long as you don't then ignore the work that needed to happen um, in those earlier stages, because in fact, it really does matter. We can move to the next slide. So I'm going to walk through each stage and the way just to provide some anticipatory guidance for you guys on the webinar. I'll have a, a one slide that I'll talk about for each stage and it'll be set up just like this, where we'll talk about the types of activities and those benchmarks and outcomes. And then I'm gonna just show like one tool, something that helps you get through that stage successfully. Okay, so I'll lift up the implementation science tool for each stage, just to kind of give you a bit of a tasting menu of what implementation science has to offer. So if you think about exploration, that's the, the beginning of the work. This is where you are thinking about the population that you are going to be engaging with, assessing assets and needs, identifying possible programs. You want to start putting a team together 
to do this work, um, you know, if you're thinking about an implementation team, you want to start to assess readiness for change. So that would be thinking about that buy-in question that, that came up um, from, from some folks on and thinking about how you're going to communicate about this. So there's some really important things happening during exploration. Um, but the main thing are those first couple dot points that you're assessing assets and needs of a population and that you are identifying possible programs or practices that would be aligned with those needs and assets. So you'd know you'd be making progress if you can, for example, demonstrate need. Um, and for us, that's, that's something that would involve, you know, multiple data sources absolutely involve the population that you plan to serve would absolutely need to be a part of that needs assessment because their perceived need for, for what they would need is a critical data um, source during a needs assessment. That we'd want to demonstrate that we've done some fit and feasibility work so that when we identify potential programs that we knew that they'd be a good fit and that we would feasibly be able to pull it off. And that you would have that team starting to, to form. You'd have a you'd have a core implementation team that was coming together. Those would be some benchmarks. And if you look along the bottom, we basically talk through um, for each slide, what are the big outcomes? So you'd want to see acceptability and appropriateness. So you end the exploration stage by having selected what it is you want to do. That could be multiple strategies, it could be a single program, it depends how complex the initiative is, but you don't end exploration until you've demonstrated that what you've chosen is appropriate, so that means it's a good fit and it meets need, and you've demonstrated acceptability. So that means that the folks that are going to deliver it and the folks that are going to receive it actually want it, right? So we would be looking for some evidence of acceptability and appropriateness beyond you know, leadership saying that this was a good idea or something like that. We'd be looking for actual data to demonstrate both of those things. We can move to the next slide. So one of the tools that we use, and I'm happy to send this out afterwards, everything we develop at NERN is open source. Um, this, is, this is actually our, our most downloaded tool Believe it or not, I think it's been downloaded about half a million times, and it's, I know that's an extreme figure, but it's, we've had it for, oh, about 13 years. Uh, this is, um, we've revised it about three times. We just re-released it in September, so just about six months ago. Um, again, with our partnership with the Annie Casey Foundation, we've centered um, equity into program selection. And so this tool comes with a full discussion guide. So this, all you're seeing here is a visual of the tool, but there is a full discussion guide and an accompanying suite of tools to help organizations evaluate the fit and feasibility of a potential program or practice within the context that they work in. You can see that, um, and, and I think you can see, hopefully it's clear enough for you guys, that these six domains, that's why it's called the hexagon tool, it's not that clever of a name, we just have always called it that that these six domains are broken into two kind of, you know, meta, meta domains. One is around the, the program, the program indicators, and one is around the implementing site indicators. So the program indicators are in green, and that is support, evidence, and usability. And why we call them program indicators is because we can objectively rate the evidence, we can re objectively rate the usability of the program, we can objectively rate how much support is offered if you were to choose that program, regardless of where you implement it. So it just means that the evidence, the supports, and the usability are inherent to the program or practice. So I could take a manualized evidence-based program, and the way the discussion tool is set up is it helps you rate on a one to five scale, you know, whether it's highly evidence-based, you know, that would be a five, whether it's highly usable to mean that it's really well defined, you know, those core components, it has a fidelity checklist, and whether it's a five, you know, a one to five on support, meaning if I chose that program, what comes with it? What kind of training do I get? What kind of coaching do I receive? What kind of support do I get around using data? 
And then the blue program, uh, the blue indicators, excuse me, are implementing site indicators. And we can't objectively rate them. We can only rate them as they relate to the context and the population that you're going to implement it with. So does it highly meet need on a one to five? We would only know that if we knew the need of the population that we're working with. So that's why it's not something you can just rate alone. You have to really understand where and with whom it's being implemented. The same with fit. We can rate that on a one to five, like how strong is the fit, but we can only rate that if we know where we're going to implement it. So it is a fit with community values and history and culture, other initiatives that are going on in that same place, and then capacity. So capacity is, you know, what exists at the implementing site, like in terms of workforce or technology or financial resources. Again, we could only rate that if we knew where we were going to implement it. So again, the three green triangles, um, we can rate those um, just on their own for any program or practice. And we've done this hundreds of times uh, with different programs and practices um, in a variety of, of social service contexts. The blue, though, we have to work with the implementing site to rate it. And it's a really incredible tool to help people figure out um, if something is the right thing. Because uh, there could be something with a strong amount of research evidence, for example, that maybe just isn't a good fit. So research evidence is not privileged over the other five domains. We, we include them all equally in the analysis um, and hope that it helps people make some decisions. We can move to the next slide. So if we think about installation, once you've moved out of exploration and have decided what it is that you wanna implement, now you have to build the infrastructure to do it. So this is where we start to develop those training protocols. We start to figure out how we build competency we think about other infrastructure we need to, to support not just the practice change, but the organizational change. So what policies and procedures might need to be put in place locally or at the agency? What type of data systems do we need to have in place so we can have easy access to data that will help drive our decision-making and improvement processes? What types of collaborative partnerships do we need to have in place? So, we take a really strong look at infrastructure during installation. And so then there are some example benchmarks we see along the right that in order for us to know we're making progress in installation, we'd have to know that, that practitioners have been trained, but that also coaching, some type of coaching is in place. That we start to think about those policies, those procedures, those referral processes, you know, that really ensure that this is going to work, that we're going to have people uptake this service. That the communication protocols that we thought about during exploration, we now start actively using and we're creating good feedback loops with different stakeholders. And that we have figured out a way for practitioners to have access to data during this time period, so they can understand uh, how well you know, training happened and what you know, initial implementation can start to look like. The big outcome we look for here is adoption. So this idea that the infrastructure is in place, we can measure it, we can see it, it's visible. You know, some, if we ask someone about their coaching protocol, they can print it out. You know, they could go to a computer and say, yes, we have one and we have a protocol for coaching our practitioners. Let me show you what it is. So that to us would show that, that, that it has been adopted. And if we move to the next slide, just wanted to share um, uh, another tool from this, which is our driver's um, tool. And we have a best practices assessment. Again, this is all open source on our website that allows us to rate the extent to which the infrastructure that's needed is actually in place. And this is not a one to five scale, it's actually a zero to two scale. So zero being nothing's in place for this driver, a one being it's partially in place and a three being it's fully in place. So we look at the extent to which we have hiring processes in place, that's our selection driver, that we have best practices related to training and coaching, that we have best practices related to assessing fidelity 
And then along the right, you see those organization drivers. So we have best practices around using a decision support data system, that we have good administrative changes going on. So leaders are putting into place those types of protocols and procedures. That's what we call facilitated administration, that that's happening. So if we need to have, for example, some sort of telework policy, uh, you know, thinking how timely that is with, with the pandemic, that would be an example of an administrative change that, that happened to ensure we could create an infrastructure that was you know, meaningful to what we had to do. And then systems interventions. This has to do with that enabling context I talked about earlier, the extent to which we're kind of pulling on those systems levers, you know, making sure that we have funding and that we have maybe legislative support or we have good collaborative partners at the table for the work. So for each of those drivers you see along the triangle, I noted we rate them uh, from a zero to a two and how, how well they're in place. Each driver, if you look at our assessment, there's maybe three to five questions for each driver. The assessment's about 32 items. And it allows us to say you know, how strong the infrastructure is. So if we move to the next slide, I'll give you an example of that. So if you look here, this is for a project um, that I did, and, and no surprise in child welfare, it, it was a child well-being project, and this was a service that was being delivered to children who had exited foster care, actually, and were reunified with their, with their parents. And that intervention you know, needed a strong infrastructure. Um, and so you can see over time, we measured it. And you can see that the overall strength of the infrastructure at time one was a one. So it was partially in place. So we were doing pretty well with our hiring. You know, training and coaching didn't look didn't look too bad. Because by the way, nothing's ever perfect in life. It's very hard to get a lot of twos like we had here, actually. Um, but you could see that those organization uh, drivers, the decision support data system, the administrative stuff, the systems. Um, uh, interventions, they were, on, they were on the lower side and that kind of pulled our infrastructure down. And you can see that our fidelity was 18% of cases were receiving the intervention with fidelity. You look to time two and time three, we really strengthened that infrastructure. We really ensured we were, we were doing good hiring processes, like see how strong the coaching became. We made sure that everyone was getting coaching. And then we started to create the policies that were needed. Um, so that facilitative in, administration driver went, went really far up. And the systems intervention driver, we started to really hone in on those collaborative partnerships that were needed for, for sticky referrals, things that were really important. And then look at that. As our infrastructure strengthened, we really ended up having much stronger fidelity. So fidelity is an outcome of a strong infrastructure. And so part of implementation science is, is really to measure that. So we can move to the next slide. So I don't know, Leslie, if anything's popping up in the chat, but if there's anything that really stood out to folks about initial or, I mean, excuse me, exploration or installation, um, feel free to put that into the chat box. We don't have and any we can, comments right now. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So we can move to the next slide. This is initial implementation. So this is when you've you know, gotten through exploration and installation. And as I told you, you're typically still doing a lot of those things. And you launch into initial implementation. So this is when you initiate your new practice. You're really starting to use data for continuous improvement because things you know, aren't always perfect when you first launch. And your implementation team is really helping with communication and with checking on that infrastructure. So in that slide I showed you before, that infrastructure got strengthened because we measured it, because we had an implementation team that cared about it and wanted to, to make it stronger. So typically what we see here in terms of benchmarks, we have variability um, in the work, uh, but it's improving. And that towards the end of initial implementation, we would start to see much stronger fidelity and we even start to see some short term population change. So if you look along the bottom, what we're demonstrating during initial implementation, we know we've completed it. 
if we can demonstrate feasibility that we're actually able to implement, people are coming to the service, the service is being delivered, penetration, we're, we're serving the people that we wanted to serve, that, that, we're, that we're hitting those numbers, we have good uptake, that we're showing good fidelity, and that costs are manageable for us. Those are all the things we'd be looking for. We can move to the next slide. So I just wanted to share um, just briefly that, um, and again, we have some tools for this, that we like to suggest really simple ways for using data for improvement. So during initial implementation, we don't want folks to just be reacting to challenges. We want to proactively be thinking about the types of implementation questions we have. So honestly, we always ask people things like, what are you really worried about? What are you losing sleep over as we launch new services? And then they provide us with those um, issues that they're concerned about, and we develop questions about them. And then we think about what data would help us answer those questions. How can we get the data? Um, who's going to get it and how we can analyze it? So we have some really nice tools to help people move through um, basically a question driven process to really make sure that we're not just reacting to challenges, but that we are proactively considering what we're curious about and what maybe even we're worried about. To move to the next slide. And just wanted to note here that a big thing is that it's really important that we look at different types of data. So we often overly rely on program data. So this is the kind of administrative data we have pretty easy access to, like the number of you know, people on caseloads. Um, this is an example from um, some children's services. Um, but the thing that we spend less time on, we often ask people, what type of data are you using as part of this uh, data-driven improvement process? And there almost always is an over-reliance on program data. So we ask people to really think about how we can get good fidelity data and outcome data so that we can have the, the full set of data sources that are needed. And these are the three categories that we really heavily emphasize. You can go to the next slide. And then a super easy way of building data review into your implementation team meetings is just using like a fun exercise like this. It doesn't have to be something complicated from improvement science, you know, like a, a strict method, like a plan, do, study, act cycle. Those are really helpful, but you can also do something really easy, like we ask teams just to build into their agenda a what, so what, now what exercise. So we bring data into every implementation team meeting when we're in initial implementation, and we ask, you know, what data are we reviewing today? What patterns are we seeing? That's the what, so what, so why is this important? Like what conclusions can we draw? Now what? What actions make sense based on this data? So the, not, the what, so what, now what is really fun, and you can easily do that virtually with Google Jamboard and stuff like that. So it's a great way to get people using and interpreting data together. We can move to the next slide. So we've successfully moved through implementation, and now we're at full implementation. Um, and we hope to hang out here for as long as possible without implementation being disrupted. But you know, we're continuing to use data for improvement, but a big difference here is we're looking for more efficient and effective infrastructure. So maybe we can do things uh, less expensively and less time that we can scale them, but we wouldn't really be asking those types of efficiency and effectiveness questions related to implementation until we're pretty far down the line, because before that, we're really doing a lot of testing um, of implementation strategies and, and trying to improve them. So benchmarks here are that, you know, you really see almost all, it says on the slide all, but in, in the real world, almost all practitioners are implementing with fidelity. Supervisors are coaching fidelity or whoever the coaches are, or coaching effectively, should I say. Um, and then we start to see those longer term outcomes. So we now start to see intermediate and long term outcomes. So that's really exciting. Um, so population change, we can start to see that at full implementation. And the outcome we really hope to see here is sustainability. So we can move to the next slide. I just wanted to note that the things that we really think about for sustainability based on the research are program integration. So the extent to which whatever the new way of work is, is integrated into the overall service system. Because lots of times in a system when you're doing something new, you kind of hold that innovation to the side and kind of incubate it and give it special treatment. 
Um, and the idea of can it, can it become part of a way of work is something we look for. Do we have the capacity? So that training, that coaching, that implementation team, is that all with us and will that be sustained? We look for organizational context, that enabling context, that organizational level. So is, there, is what we're doing aligned with the values and principles of the intervention and, and the organization itself? Do we have committed leadership? Have we refined policies and procedures to make sure staff can do what's expected of them? And then finally, have we built trusting relationships? Have we done really good collaborative decision making? Do we have a shared vision with all the stakeholders involved? These kind of four big buckets are things that we look for. And um, we do have a tool for this as well um, to help people ask some key questions around these four areas. So we can move to the next slide. I don't know, Leslie, if there's anything in the chat. No, we don't have any comments. Okay, so what I might do then is just, I'm gonna cover just two more slides. Um, I don't think I'll get through the last couple, but I'd like just to talk about this idea of implementation support practitioner principles and competencies. So this idea of we're moving through implementation, it's just thinking about, you know, well, what does it take to do that work? Like we just went through all of those stages. So if you just go to the next slide, I just wanted to share this graphic with you all, because this is where I spend a lot of my time working these days, um, is thinking about what does it take to do the work? And if you look in the middle of that circle, we think there's some values and principles that really need to guide our ability to be helpful in supporting implementation, that we need to be curious, we need to be empathic, we need to understand other people's perspectives is so critical to the work being committed, using critical thinking, really focusing on equity in every decision we make, and embrace, embracing cross-disciplinary approaches. So bringing in different methods if they're needed into the work. So we guide, use those principles to guide our work, and then you see along the outside those three circles. We think that the type of work we do across those stages falls into three big buckets co-creation and engagement, so where we're co-learning, we're brokering connections across different stakeholders, we're addressing power differentials in the system that are not good for equitable implementation, just as an example. For ongoing improvement, we're, we're really seeking to understand context, we're conducting those improvement cycles, and then how we sustain change, we believe, is through relationships. It's through trust, it's through teams, it's through champions and leaders, and that's how we end up with the capacity to keep going. So I just wanted to share that with you because we have a practice guide that talks a lot about these skills and how to develop them. And I just wanted to share that. The next couple slides were just about this in a little more detail, so you really haven't missed anything. But I wanted to share that at the end that I really think that our role in supporting implementation really requires uh, skills and for us to really think about. So I'll pause there, Leslie. I know we're ending in about a minute. Um, I'm not gonna go through those last three slides for the sake of time. But if anyone has any final comments, I'll certainly look at them in the question or the chat. But it didn't seem like any came up, Leslie. No, actually we didn't. And we do only have a minute left. So um, barring any comments coming in at the last minute, I do want to just say thank you very much, Allison. I appreciated you doing this for me a lot. I think the information was helpful, even though we didn't get through the entire presentation. I will say that when this is posted online, those last several slides with that information will still be included in the PowerPoint. So those slides will still be available for people. And um, I want to thank everybody for your time today. I, unfortunately, we do not have time built in for questions, and we do need to log off right now. <laughs> so thank you again, Thanks, Allison. Leslie. And I wish everyone a very safe and happy afternoon.